Welcome everyone. I'm Diego Sanchez, COO at HousingWire. And our webinar topic today is how mortgage lenders can stop revenue leakage from appraisal fees. And we're hosted today by Regora. A few housekeeping items. We'll be having a Q&A session toward the end of the webinar. And you can submit questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A icon on your screen. In this webinar, we will shed light on how lenders can bolster their margins by plugging the P&L holes stemming from appraisal fees. Nowadays, a majority of lenders experience losses from escalated fees that aren't eligible for a circumstance change or from transactions that fail for various reasons before the lender can recover the appraisal payment from the borrower. Although these losses might seem immaterial individually, they accumulate significantly over time. The silver lining is this issue can be effectively addressed through technology, and we'll discuss that today. For today's webinar, I'm joined by two industry experts. First, Mike Seminari, Director of Customer Experience at the Stratmore Group. Stratmore Group Customer Experience Director who specializes in operationalizing excellence in the customer journey, implementing creative problem-solving solutions, and identifying opportunities to improve the borrower's experience. He has a wealth of experience with over 20 years in the mortgage and banking technology industries. He's one of the industry's leading authorities on customer experience through his speaking engagements at major industry conferences, his contributions to Stratmore-led workshops, his appearances on industry podcasts, and in video interviews. Welcome again, Mike. Thank you. Glad to be here. And then, of course, we have Brian Zitten, CEO and co-founder of Regora. Regora is a leading technology provider modernizing the appraisal process for lenders and appraisers. Regora is focused on making it simple for lenders to get fast, high-quality appraisals done on all their loans. They differentiate the experience that you can offer borrowers by significantly reducing operating costs, and they make it much easier for you to manage collateral. Regora works with lenders and appraisers across the country and has experienced exponential growth over the past year as more lenders shift their focus towards improving their appraisal process. Welcome again, Brian. Thank you for having me, Diego. All right, well, let's jump in today's, into, into today's content. Brian, you engaged Stratmore to help study this issue of revenue leakage from appraisal fees. Why did you decide to engage a third-party research firm on this topic? Yeah, so we... Uh, to, you know, as you just mentioned, provide, you know, workflow software to all different types of lenders. And, you know, as we've done that, we've solved a lot of problems for them. One of the biggest has always been payments and workflows around fees. And, you know, this, you can see the agenda in front of us, we're going to go through, you know, the study that I'll, you know, I'll talk about and Michael obviously expand on and, you know, where most of those fees are lost and how we solve them. Um, but we had, you know, seen success in various capacities. You can see here a couple examples of you know small medium large lenders where um, by solving you know pretty straightforward workflow things we save them a ton of money so we realized that this was probably a problem for you know not just people who were coming to us but everyone in the industry and so we wanted to enlist you know an unbiased third party that's really solid with data super high quality well respected in the industry and so obviously stratmore was you know our go-to there um, to kind of conduct this on our behalf outside of just our customer base but the, the total industry. So we're super excited to, to partner here. And Mike, I'll, I'll let you kind of expand around what exactly it is that you all did. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, so so when, when Brian came to us with this, we were excited to um, to actually take this project on. We, as, as he said, we're agnostic. So I told him right away, what, whatever the data says, it says, it's not going to be um, bent to, to rigor as well or anything like that, but it's, uh, we, we were interested because we kind of heard some of the same anecdotal information coming out. Like there, there is a lot of leakage coming in. People are, are eating fees. People are eating escalation fees. People are paying processing fees. There's just, there's a lot of places where cost is, is, um, is being lost. And especially right now, I, I think this is kind of a top of mind issue because, you know, I, I was just on a call yesterday. We were sharing some information um, around just the industry in general and uh, talking about how only 28% of lenders were profitable by the end of 2022 is just a tough time. I mean, we all know it, but the numbers are pretty bleak in terms of 
uh, the, the cost per loan back in 2020 was was eighty two hundred dollars per unit, and today it's more than thirteen thousand. Um, so there's there's so so much um, focus right now on on, on PNL and, and where can we save costs without just laying everybody off. And this is one area um, I, I think the reason this excited me about the study was. This is a very tangible way. When you start adding up some of these numbers, they, they're very big numbers for cost savings that are that are possible. And uh, and it's a way that you can do it without having to cut more staff. So uh, so that's a little bit bit of background. So what when we when we did this, we um, we looked at we we sent it out to a hundred a little more than a thousand potential respondents and we, we typically like to see somewhere between five and 7% response rate. We ended up getting 7.6%. So 81 individuals is representing 75 unique companies responded. Uh, when you're doing a, a study like this, you want to get probably 50 or north of 50. Um, where, when it's a very targeted study, you know who the respondents are, you know, they're, 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 the person that handles appraisals at their company. So it's a very targeted list. So uh, we feel like uh, 75 is, is a very good cross-section sample of, of the industry here. So very viable um, sample to work with. We ran it from May 16th to June 3rd. So very fresh data. Uh, we ended up getting about 50%, so 47% bank and 9% credit union, 31% independent, which, um, which I, I think may be a little skewed to bank, but it's a, it's a very good mix of industry, uh, of companies across the industry. And the, uh, in terms of the approach companies take, again, this is very representative of what we see in the industry. About, you know, a little under half or about half were mostly or full AMC. Uh, nine percent even split, another forty percent um, leaned on the panel side. So, uh, so yeah, I, I guess all that to say, it's a good sample, viable. You know, we can trust the data. It's a it's a good representative mix of what's in the um, in the mortgage industry right now. And so, uh, yeah, that, uh, the yeah, I, I guess that, that's all I would say about the the data. It's 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 trustworthy. We, we're happy with it with where that landed awesome cool well let me um i'll jump to the next slide and we can dig into the kind of first and, and maybe you know biggest pain point here around the, the you know leakage yeah so what, one of the first things we asked was uh how often are you losing the whole appraisal fee because a loan falls through and it you know it turned out one in eight loans so pretty high um I, I will explain this data a little bit because when when you say one in eight loans and then you have 70 percent um, say that it only happened one to ten percent of the time but the average is 13 that um, it's it's almost a head scratcher because you're like well if 70 percent of the group was between one and ten how are you getting that uh, that far uh, above 10 but a lot of the responses were cl very close to that 10 in that one to 10 tranche. And so you have some of these pulling it higher. It was really surprising here. 9% said that they were having greater than 30% of their loans. They're, they're eating the appraisal fee because the deal walked away or fell through. Um, that tells me that they're, they're ordering the appraisal probably too, too soon on those or just, uh, you know, their pull through is terrible. But uh, when we looked at it, depository versus IMB, not much difference between those two. You had um, uh, a lot more on the IMB side said they, you know, they th this wasn't a problem at all. They had none, thirteen percent. But other than that, um, pretty close on, on some of these other numbers. So I, I think Brian. The number you would probably key in on on this when you see it is is that thirteen percent, right? But that's that's a lot of loans um, where the where that fee is being eaten. And is there a chance to recoup or or not have to to spend some of that money? I think you went on mute, Brian. Yeah, sorry. There and you know, and I'll probably repeat this point a couple of times throughout this. But thirteen percent 
during like the lowest volume time when people are already pinching pennies and trying to be more on top of this stuff. So you can imagine what that number probably is during times of more heavy volume when like, you know, loan officers and folks have even more influence over, you know, the decision making process here. And maybe for, for any folks who are on this webinar who are kind of wondering what this means from the actual workflow standpoint, typically this will happen when the appraisal fee is not collected up front, like it's collected at close. So the lender orders the appraisal and then the borrower falls through, but the appraiser already went to the property, did the report maybe even, and so they're on the hook for paying this you know, appraisal fee. Um, and so when you add up, and this is just kind of a hypothetical in terms of you know average 5,000 loans a year sort of thing times that average lost fee amount times the average appraisal fee, once again, that, that appraisal fee will differ depending on which geographic focus a lender is in, but that's generally ballpark around the average based on some higher areas, California, you know, things like that, you know, over $400,000 lost. Um, and you imagine for these bigger lenders who are doing tens of thousands of loans, it's, you know, in the millions of, of dollars range. So I thought this was surprising and pretty substantial. So, um, you know, obviously the, the first question is, okay, well, how do we, how do we solve this? And it's very, very straightforward in, in practice, although a little bit more, you know, complicated in, in actual execution, but really the solution is just collecting the payment up front. So, you know, Mike mentioned, you know, another possible scenario is that people are ordering the appraisal too soon. Um, we've seen that sometimes people like to order the appraisal before the borrower gives intent to proceed. Uh, because they think that the appraisal turn time is too slow and might hold up the loans. So they want to get it done as soon as possible. Right now, turn time is not really a problem in terms of holding up the loan. And so, you know, the, the recommended best practice is to just wait until the borrower actually gives intent to proceed and make sure that they pay for it up front. Pretty much any modern solution out there should be able to automatically trigger you know, a payment link to the borrower, whether it's via a white labeled email or, you know, through a mobile, you can see our version of it here. Sometimes even, you know, embedded directly within the point of sale system um, where the borrower will pay for the appraisal and the appraisal isn't technically actually ordered, initiated with the, you know, a vendor until it's paid for. So really the, you know, for this, you would think would seem like a no brainer, but where there's pushback sometimes is from, loan officers, sales staff who don't want to collect the appraisal payment up front and want to, you know, reduce friction or any perceived friction, rather. I think that the jury is out whether, that, whether that's actually the case um, from the borrower. And so they don't have to pay it up front. They just collect it at close. So that's oftentimes where we see the pushback is from, you know, sales staff who are particularly opinionated about this. Um, and obviously, depending on the model, they're not necessarily the ones bearing the cost here, which is why we, we don't see everyone necessarily doing this all over the place. So Brian, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here with a, with a question. How, how do you, how do you deal with that scenario where maybe you have some top producers who, who don't want to collect that payment up front, but as an organization in general, you want to collect that payment up front. How, how do you deal with that nuance there? Yeah. So we've seen a variety of solutions from lenders. Some are just like, look, this is the way it is. And they're, they're, they just lay down the law and say, you know, this is the most operationally efficient way. This is this is what it is. Some some folks, to your point, want to accommodate their top producers. And so, you know, we, we have something, for example, where you can configure this on a branch level. And so if, you know, XYZ branches are, you know, top producers and you want to be able to accommodate them, you know, you're going to let them do theirs, collect that close. Um, some Lenders even let the loan officers or processors decide this on an order by order basis. So, you know, the default is collecting it up front, but they can, you know, do it, collect that close, but it has to be approved by, you know, a branch manager or something like that. Or if they do decide to do it, collect that close and the deal falls out, then they are on the hook for the fee themselves. So there's a variety of, you know, approaches that will depend philosophically on the lender. Obviously, you need something to actually handle that workflow or otherwise it becomes more complicated than you know it needs to be so i would say it depends on kind of the strictness of of the lender and, and how kind of on the spectrum they want to up 
you know, optimize for operational efficiency versus also accommodating their, you know, production staff. And Mike, did, were there any, was there any data or kind of anecdotal evidence in this study on this topic of collecting upfront versus collecting at close? Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of things, a couple of notes here that I could make. One is that I agree that it's very important to address this because when we look at uh, in, in this market, well, in, in this market or even in, in the recent past markets, the top producers really are often the tail that wags the dog. So you really have, you do have to pay attention to what they're saying and what they're demanding or asking for. Um, so having that flexibility is important. We, we see uh, in our data that 83% of all lender volume is done by the top 40% of LOs. And so the, the bottom 60% on flip side doing 17% of, of the loan volume. So you, you really do need to pay attention to retain good top people and, and listen to them and, and, and do what they're asking uh, if you want to keep people around. And so I, I think what Brian was talking about, having that flexibility where you can say, okay, you're an exception, you're an exception, but everybody else has to follow this way. Um, is probably the best way to do it. Um, the The study itself did ask the question: When you're not collecting the appraisal up front, how come? And this, we we did see kind of underlying data for this, where close to forty percent said we're scared about friction between the borrower, and we don't, you know, in, in that LO borrower relationship, we don't want to mess that up. Um, some of the other responses were around cultural reasons. So we're a credit union and it's just part of our, you know, member experience that we want to have is that we don't, don't want to ask for too much too soon. Um, my commentary on that would be that I'm not so sure, like I, I appreciate that you want to have low friction and a good experience and a good member experience, but at what cost? Right. It, the I think the the solution maybe is not let's just wait because the, if you get to the core of this problem of, about friction, people are scared to ask for too much for too soon because they haven't developed a deep enough relationship with the client where that's a natural ask, and so the solution is is not just to wait longer and have that relationship organically grow. It's to get deeper sooner. So. I, I would say the solution is coach your employees to get deeper sooner so that this is a natural thing. So it's not a asking for too much. You're, you're already to the third date and then you can ask for the good night kiss or whatever. You, want. you know, it's like, it's your, um, you, you want to develop that sooner. And so, so that there's, there's no anxiety around having to ask for that, but the benefit is, like Brian was saying, huge. It's you know, half a million, million dollars if you're five or 10,000 units a year. Um, so that I think that's worth the trade-off of, of doing a little coaching internally to deepen relationships sooner. I, I think that's a great point. Obviously, I'm, I, stay, I try to stay in my humble appraisal lane, but an anecdotally, definitely heard from like, you know, top producers that they actually like collecting the appraisal because they get some, you know, buy-in, like, you know, if, if the, if the borrower isn't going to be willing to pay five, 600 bucks for an appraisal, how committed to you are they on the corollary? If they do, they want to stay with you and probably, you know, follow through on the loan because they don't want to just give up to five, 600 bucks. So I, I, you know, I like, I like that thought around, you know, it, it could it be just a coaching problem. And not only that, but you, the top producers are the ones who naturally are better at deepening those relationships earlier. So that's probably why they're, they're more comfortable with that because they're like, yeah, I'm already doing this. I'm already, I already have the report because I've already created it. So why not? Awesome. Well, so that, you know, problem number one, you know, to, to kind of put a bow on that multiple different types of solutions, ultimately you want potentially some flexibility to accommodate this. Um, but generally a lot, a lot of, you know, room to pick up some some cost savings here on this one specifically. All right, next one here for you, Mike. Yeah, so the, the, the next major point of revenue leakage we anticipated going into the survey was that uh, the people are having escalations and the, the, the company's eating those fees as well. So the uh, kind of the same, same question, how, what percentage of this time is this happening? 
and we, we put three criteria. So an escalation fee is required, didn't qualify for a change of circumstance. So it is on the lender. You And then you uh, paid for the escalation fee. And we saw average 14%, so a little higher than the other one. Um, and some were greater than 50%, uh, which is which is incredible. But uh, yeah, the, and by the way, I, I'll reiterate that this, this is not 2021, 2022 data. This is actually first quarter 2023. Every, everything we asked was within the past quarter, um, share these numbers with us. So uh, yeah, so 14%, that's one in seven loans um, that this is happening to. Uh, again, it's a, it's a major point of, um, of possibility for, for cost savings, Brian. Yeah, and the only other kind of additional commentary, what we see with a lot of folks is um, something that, that could have qualified for a change of circumstance, but they kind of botched it operationally. And so it, it didn't, because there's a, there's a certain time limit to, you know, take action on change of circumstance and, and redisclose. And if they, they don't do it faster, then um, you know, then you can't do it anymore. So I would, I would guess in the real world, this, this number is potentially even higher if you start counting those as well. Um, but this, you know, could be for a variety of reasons, whether the, from what we see, like the loan officers or production staff, they're ordering the wrong product and they need to, you know, increase the fee because they, you know, they ordered conventional, even though it was FHA or something like that, or the appraiser went out to the property and it's going to be more complex than, than they originally thought. So they have to charge extra or, you know, for some reason it turns into a rush order. So there's a variety of, of reasons why the kind of initial fee that was disclosed isn't going to be the, the kind of end goal fee. And a lot of folks, you know, aren't, aren't collecting that and therefore losing it, you know, and, and paying it out of pocket here. It's yeah. And it's also worth noting that this is probably the, the trough um, of, of where this number will ever be when, when we were in 2020 and 2021, um, the, um, uh, the, the sheer number of escalations was way higher, right? So there's, so that 14 might've been 20 or 25% at that point of, of, uh, ones that fell into this bucket. Right. So that will, we'll maybe put this, you know, in, in that example where similarly going back to our, our lender who was doing 5,000 loans a year times 14% of those having fee escalations that get lost. This is the average fee escalation that we've seen, or was this from was from your data, Mike? In terms of that average fee escalation amount, I think this was from a, a previous study we did. Yeah. Okay, so that you know that's the average fee escalation across a bunch of different lenders. That could be, like I said, complexity rush, different things like that. So you know, one hundred twenty six thousand um, dollars just on these as well, potentially on top of the earlier, you know, four hundred five hundred thousand dollars that we were talking about before. Um, so definitely another big chunk here. Um, so once again, what, what, you know, how do you solve for this? There's, this one's a little bit more complex in terms of how you potentially solve for it, because there's a variety of reasons that, that this could be going wrong. Um, and so kind of step one, we, we have a few different you know, suggestions here, um, is number one, you want to disclose the correct amount as much as you can correctly up front. We see a lot of lenders who don't have a ton of sophistication when it comes to the granularity of the fee schedule. So, for example, they do a lot of loans in Texas, but they have you know one fee for Texas. Whereas you know if you look at a county in Dallas versus something in Austin, the the you know fees for that are going to be dramatically different. Um, same thing by you know product type, even you know or properties over a million versus under a million. If folks don't have proper granularity on those disclosures, then it's you know significantly more likely that when the appraiser actually gets the order that they're going to do a fee escalation, and uh, you know you may eat have to eat that if you don't do it properly. Uh, so step one is you know getting as much input as possible in terms of disclosing this correctly. We and this can even just be human error. We we see a lot of lenders workflows where the amount that gets disclosed is literally like hand inputted by a loan officer instead of automatically populating from a fee table, for example. So a couple of potential workflow improvements there. Yeah, yeah Brian, an uh, 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 audience question just came in that I think is, is pretty relevant um, to this. 
how do you properly disclose a fee that you can't expect, such as a complexity or an unforeseen trip fee? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's it's impossible to get this to zero percent. Like there will inevitably be, you know, some that pop up because, you know, even in public record, it's X, Y, Z type of property. And then when you get there, there's, you know, something crazy going on with it. But like I said, a, a lot, there's, there is a lot that you can do to reduce this by having more granularity and sophistication in the differentiation around products. Like I typically don't see a lot of lenders have a different fee for properties that are above a million versus below, right? So there, there are certain variables that are more predictable around complexity, like property size, you know, rural versus suburban. And so if you can get more granular in terms of breaking things down by zip code, product type, and other sort of variables around that. And by the way, this is all data that's in the LOS system typically. And so like a lot of our customers don't, this is all automatic. Like it just, it's just automatically selecting the correct product based off of all of the particular parameters that would go into this. So like I said, inevitably there will be some of these that pop up. Um, but if you have people that, for example, the branch knows that this particular zip code you know, has a lot of mountain homes that are more complex, then you can tweak that on a, on a zip code level and preemptively increase that one by 50, 100 bucks, something like that, so that, you know, the borrower, first of all, you know, you, the lender, don't have to eat that. But second of all, it's not a great borrower experience to have to, you know, get a fee escalation later down the line. And so if you can manage those expectations up front, then you can significantly improve that experience. And do you have, does Regora have, an API connection into the LOS so that that's an automated process in your platform as opposed to having to manually like compare? You know, exactly. Like basically we will automatically be monitoring the LOS and let's say intent to proceed gets addressed or um, intent to proceed gets, you know, knocked down so that we know that's going to trigger an order. We're going to look at the, the address, the zip code, the purchase price or the estimated value you know, is it rural or, or suburban and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we can, we can grab it all from the LOS automatically. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a borrower experience issue here as well. Um, so, you know, how, how do we, um, how do we improve the borrower experience and, and make sure that the, you know, that, that, that we're in sync in this, in, in this, in this process? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think it's, a worse experience, obviously, if the loan officer who's supposed to be, you know, your your trusted partner here in this loan journey is telling you, hey, the appraisal fee is going to be 500. And then, you know, four days later, like, oh, sorry, it's actually going to be 600. Right. So if you can manage that up front by like figuring out, hey, is this property potentially more likely to be complex, then you can, you know, eliminate that. I see, you know, in the comments, um, you know, and, and this is like, this is potentially a valid change of circumstance, as someone is saying. So the lender is allowed to recharge for this, which is actually the next point here that, that I'll talk about. So maybe it's a good time for me to um, jump to the next slide. You know, a lot of loan officers don't want to read it. This, these are some screenshots, examples of fee escalations happening. And there, there's a couple of things that go on here. First of all, a lot of the times when the appraisal vendors are communicating these things, it's just over like free form chat. Like they'll just message the lender and be like, hey, X, Y, Z is going on with the property. It's going to be more complex. So a human on the lender side has to see that, then communicate with the loan officer, production staff, explain the reason why. And there's not a ton of automation around it. So, you know, there are various things you can do to kind of get templated reason codes around, you know, why this is going to have a fee escalation and, and determine whether that's a valid change of circumstance. But as someone indicated in the chat here, loan officers are oftentimes hesitant to recharge the borrower, even if it's a valid change of circumstance. Because like I said, that, that's, a, that's a bad experience to, to be like, you told me it was 500, why am I paying 600 now? And then oftentimes you have to send like another payment link out or, or something like that. So, um, you know, as you can see here, kind of the process that we've outlined, do as much as you can to make sure that that doesn't happen up front easily and accurately determine if it is a valid change of circumstance and you know you can do different things with the LOS and automation there making it simple to redisclose and then flexible payment options so one thing that was like a little feature request that we saw people really enjoyed was that instead of having to resend out a payment link to a borrower 
and they log on to their phone or go on their email and key in all their information again, is that the lender can opt to just recharge the existing card that already paid. So if they paid that $500 up front and it's going to go to 600 instead of that whole process, someone can literally just hit a button and recharge the card for a hundred bucks. So as long as the loan officer is willing to have that conversation with them and actually do the redisclosures, the lender doesn't need it. It's relatively simple experience for the borrower. Um, and like I said, oftentimes what's happening, if they even choose to redisclose, is that they'll just do it at close. And so you run that risk again of the borrower falling out of the process and then you being on the hook to, to eat that fee potentially. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in with a, just a best practice that I hear um, from the lenders that I talk to. And that is when you're talking appraisal fees, coach your LOs to, to talk about them in ranges to say, best case, it's going to be 500 and that's the amount that I'm going to collect up front, but it could be as high as a as thousand or, or in, in that range. We're going to assume that it's the lowest right now, but I will let you know as we hear more from the appraiser, what, how, where they classify your property, if there's complexity, if there's um, any other um, escalations that need to happen. So setting that expectation up front, the customer's thrilled if there's not, but they've already, they're kind of, their expectation is set. So they're not terribly upset if there is an escalation that's a that's a valid change of circumstance i i agree and actually to piggyback on the earlier point once again if you have those top producers who are willing to have a little bit more of the uncomfortable conversations and manage expectations up front in that regard um, we've seen some lenders purposefully over disclose you know but with the commentary that you said like hey we're going to disclose this at 700 but it could be anywhere from 500 to 700 and then if you if you slightly over disclose, then you you don't have this redisclosure chain of circumstance issue. And then to your point, if they charge less, great, it's a nice surprise, you know. If not, but once again, you have to be willing to have that conversation, you know, which, which not everyone is. So um, it's an interesting you know pickle there. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that I've always loved um, that I I heard years ago uh, was that I, I talked to an LO who had these are for, here's the 41 things that could go wrong on your loan. And they gave them a list and they went through them one by one. It, you know, and when that happens, they can, they can just point to, okay, number 17 happened. I, I told you it was a possibility. You never know which one of these things are going to, you know, are going to hit, but almost no loan goes through with nothing, you know, going wrong. So, um, or no bumps or whatever you want to call them. So I, I always love setting that expectation of here are the different, you know, landmines that, that may pop up, but uh, we're going to try to avoid them all, but we may not avoid them all. So um, the, the more you can set that expectation and that baseline at the beginning, the, the less you're, you're having to apologize. So that's not an apology call. Sorry, I was wrong. I misinformed you. That's not what it is. It's We knew this was a possibility going in. We knew it was a, little, a small chance, but it was a chance. And you know, it happened. That's life. So it's that's that's a much better experience from from a borrower standpoint. Right. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, I think we had one more here on this point for fee escalations, um, which is more so <clears throat> on the kind of vendor management side, but is you know just using vendors that that do less fee escalations. So, you know, <clears throat> we see this as a metric that some lenders aren't even tracking or can't even properly track. Like I said, in, in some platforms, fee escalations are just happening over freeform text chat. So they're not really reportable. So you don't actually know how often these are happening. Um, but if you do have you know, the reporting available and you see these three AMCs or these you know, pocket of vendors have a significantly higher fee escalation percentage than these others, then you can dig in from a vendor management standpoint and say, you know, what's going on here? Um, and you can see here we have this Uber style fulfillment um, service that we call the appraisal marketplace, where our, our fee escalation rate is significantly lower than the average. And what, what goes into this is essentially the vendors, and this is maybe more specific to the lenders who use AMCs or even their appraisal desk, but the more you're able to allocate orders to appraisers who are already geographically competent in the area, already close and, and have capacity, the less likely they are to do a fee escalation. <clears throat> Where you see more frequent escalations is the guy who's, you know, 
30 miles away. And he was like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go do this for you. But you know, I need to get paid X, Y, Z more. Right. So the, the better that you can optimize the allocation and the better that you can manage your vendors, the less of this will happen in, you know, the first place. Brian, this is a, a recent launch by Regora, this appraisal marketplace. And it was a really interesting launch. Um, can you talk a little bit about like appraiser density on the platform now and and why why you're seeing such a low fee escalation rate with with this marketplace? Well, the kind of core problem in appraisal is that it's very fragmented, right? There's like tens of thousands of individual appraisers, there's hundreds of AMCs. And so if I let's say that there's two lenders in Florida, right? In you know Orlando or or some area where they're nearby each other. If I'm you know lender number one and I'm going to order an appraisal for a particular neighborhood, I'm only seeing my own data. So I don't know if there are other appraisers who are already going to be in that area or something. So it's all very fragmented and siloed, and and usually the allocation decisions are not as optimal as they could be because of this fragmentation. So our approach on this was to essentially aggregate all of the data across the entire platform and say, hey, lender one is ordering an appraisal in this neighborhood of Florida. Lender two, two days later, is also ordering an appraisal in that neighborhood. Can we batch those orders together? And the appraiser who's going there is obviously going to be way more willing to take that order on at the baseline price because their mindset is like, yeah, I'm going to be in that area that day anyways. I might as well take this one and, you know, and get the extra fee versus, like I said, an appraiser who, if you're trying to assign it and they're across town or a different county or you know further away it's going to be harder to get them to do that order in the time that you want without them charging a higher fee um so there's ultimately a lot of like upstream and downstream effects of optimizing the you know allocation here all right cool um last one i think mike there is another interesting stat here that you guys did around the credit card fees yeah this was the third third of the three the, the full appraisal being lost, the escalation, and then the credit card fee, which on it, on the nose, it seems like, well, this is pretty small fee, right? Uh, a couple percent. Um, but again, it, when you put the numbers in, it really adds up because this is not just on a few, this is on all appraisals. So you, you're talking about, um, yeah, the, the numbers just really add up. So when, when we, uh, we, we basically just asked a simple question. When are you paying? When are you passing on? And so 50, more than half said, we, we are paying the fees. Uh, 18% percent said that they're paid by the bar, kind of embedded in those AMC fees, and then 30% directly charged to the bar. Uh, but this was, uh, this is pretty big. If you're paying all the fees on all of your appraisals, all these credit card fees, I mean, Nobody's paying it by cash or check anymore. So this is like, this is all the appraisals. And and it, I'm sure you have a slide here, Brian, to address this, but how much money this adds up to. But I'm, my guess is it's a lot, right? Yeah, another, another hundred grand. So yeah, I mean, and this is yeah. like, if you're following the good best practice of collecting up front, yeah, to your point, inevitably, that'll likely be a credit card. Um, and, you know, it'll, it'll range 3%, I'd say is on the higher end. You know, if you're doing a lot of volume, you could get down to like 2.5, you know, 2.6, 2.7. But to your point, since it's on every single one, probably it's still adding up to a big chunk here. Um, and so if you package all these together, I think just for this 5,000 loan lender, if they're doing all the wrong things, they could be, you know, $600,000 in, in costs right there between all, all these various issues. Um, so you know, I mean, it, the, 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 the solution is, is pretty straightforward, you know, to your kind of earlier point here in this environment, just pass the fee along to, you know, the borrower. I, I think the, the general mindset is kind of going back to our earlier conversation. If the, if the borrower is going to stop working with you over, you know, a $20 difference in the appraisal fee, then maybe they weren't, you know, properly vetted in the beginning and, and that sort of thing. I think there's, there's certainly still this mindset around trying to reduce appraisal fees as much as possible. And when we, we, so, you know, as part of our platform, we like send a white label delivery of the appraisal at the end to the borrower. And, and in, in that we did a survey where we surveyed like a thousand borrowers in terms of like, Hey, what do you care about most when it comes to the appraisal? 
the quality of the appraisal and the speed of the appraisal were, you know, the top two cost was at the bottom of the list. So once again, like this is not necessarily the thing to be optimizing for if you want to get all the other parts of the appraisal correct. It's certainly a factor. Um, but in times like this, where I think you said less than 30% of lenders are profitable right now, like, you know, this is a pretty easy thing to just flip a switch and, and you know, save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I'll put it a slightly different than you put it. You said if the if the borrower is going to leave you over a hundred bucks, you maybe didn't vet them well enough. The, the problem is not the borrower. The problem is you. If if, you, if they're going to leave you over a hundred dollars and go somewhere else, then then you did not develop that relationship deeply enough um, because that there's no reason anybody should leave or or look somewhere else over a hundred couple hundred bucks, uh, hundred fifty bucks, whatever it is. Yeah, someone's asking in the chat, like, you know, that they've they've heard anecdotally that, you know, it impacts pull through. That would be a very difficult thing to actually try to quantify, right? You'd have to have like the same borrowers with one out of 630 fee and one out of 650 fee and keeping every single thing else constant, which I imagine was probably, you know, not probably done. You I think it's to your, you know, whoever made this comment, usually an anecdotal thing, not actually backed by you know, clean statistics typically is, is that misconception? Um, cause like I said, you know, we are, our, our survey said otherwise. So, um, but, but maybe there's some out there, but none that I've seen. Um, so yeah, I think those are the core, um, pieces. I, I think Diego, I hand it over to you if there's any other questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let's pause here for a moment, um, because I think this is a, you know, kind of a unique offering that Regora has here. We, we had these slides about, uh, all these fees and how they're adding up. Um, but like, it's, you know, sounds like you'll do a consultation with, with, with lenders and specifically hone in on what, what, what the leakage is with, with their, with their, with their company. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, thanks to, you know, the help of Stratmore here, we have this great data where it's pretty straightforward. If you're working with someone who knows kind of appraisal workloads to say, okay, how are you doing this? How are you doing that? And spit out, okay, well, this is, you know, likely how much money you're losing or, or could save. So, you know, this session is really just kind of like a doubling down on this sort of material today around, um, you know, hey, how much money could we save and can you help us figure that out? Because oftentimes the people who are boots in the ground, you know, they need to make a business case to their kind of boss or operational executive to, to, to show and articulate, hey, if we do X, Y, Z things and it'll result in this amount of savings. And so with, with this data, you can actually make a pretty quantifiable and compelling version of that, you know, pretty straightforwardly. Um, okay, so uh, we just dropped uh, in the resource tab, some follow-up if you wanna take advantage of uh, one of these complimentary sessions. So uh, taking a step back, Mike, um, going a little bit more high level, what was the most surprising part of this study to you? And, and are there any key insights we didn't address that you think the lenders on this call should know? Yeah, I think that the, the most surprising thing to me, and this, by the way, this was not a three question survey that we, we asked about 20 questions on this. So there's a lot more data that, that goes in, which we'll be releasing at a later time, the, the full thing um, in partnership with Regora, but I think that the biggest thing that popped off the page to me is that uh, we do a lot of surveying, post-close surveying, in process, kind of uh, around the loan journey for borrowers, and uh, to the tune of a, a million surveys over the last 10 years. So uh, really a ton of data. And the NPS, the Net Promoter Score, which uh, really focuses on advocacy, will somebody recommend to you? Uh, that it, that is a, a z negative 100 to 100 scale. So you can be anywhere in between there. Um, the best companies in the world are, you know, Apple, Starbucks, those companies are in the 70s and 80s. The airlines are often in the teens. <laughs> and the, it, if you're below zero, that means on average, people are more likely to badmouth you than to say good things about you. So you don't, you don't wanna be below zero. Um, this study, we asked, how, how likely are you to re recommend your AMC to fr friends or colleagues? And it was negative four, which 
is is pretty you know pretty much an indictment on uh, it's it's not just that people are ho hum. It's that they're not having a great experience with 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 their AMCs. There's a lot of frustration there, and you know I I, I don't know how much can be solved if if someone like Rigor is the magic bullet, but there's definitely room for better service and, and a better experience from a lender standpoint um, in dealing with appraisals. And. We have a couple of questions in the chat about about the survey that you did, um, sure. and wanting to take a closer look at at some of those results. Um, is there a time frame for uh, for the for the two of you to to partner up and and send and send that those results out? We we haven't set an ETA yet, um, but I'm sure that we can keep the list of attendees right uh, from this and, and we can make sure that we let you know when we release those results or we may do another webinar that, that goes deeper into some of these things at a later time. So we, we can definitely keep you in the loop. Glad you're interested. It, it was very interesting data all around. Absolutely. Well, Brian, um, where, where do you wanna end here? Uh, you know, what's, what's, your, what's your big takeaway um, uh, you know, from this study and, and the implications for the appraisal process and, and working with lenders? Yeah, I mean, I think to, to kind of Mike's point early on, people are looking for cost savings and don't, you know, don't necessarily want to lay off more people than they already have. And these are pretty easy things to do, to be honest, um, and, you know, that can result in some big savings. So appraisal is just one of those things where it's it's tough to quantify workflow changes you know, how do you quantify improving your turn times by one day? How do you quantify X, Y, Z? So I think Stratmore did an amazing job to help us actually quantify some of this stuff. And it just shows that the industry still has a long way to go in terms of making optimizations on all these things. So, um, you know, obviously glad that that we could help with this. Um, I do see a couple of questions that I can just quickly touch on if, if we have some time. Yeah, please. To go. Um, someone asked, and this is, relevant to solution number three, like passing the credit card fee along, they asked, how is the credit card processing fee considered part of the appraisal fee for compliance reasons? We were under the impression that you can only charge for the appraiser fee itself. The credit card fee must be separate. Um, we've talked to, you know, the lawyers behind some of these actual regulations. And the metaphor that they gave was, you know, when you go to McDonald's, they don't tell you the cost of the pickles and the mustard and the cheese and the beef. They, they give you the price of the burger and all the various things that go into it. And so I think that there is a similar interpretation for the appraisal fee where this is the fee that goes into getting the appraisal done. And it encapsulates you know everything associated with that. Um, and so we, we see it as very common that appraisal fees get, or the you know credit card fee gets lumped into that. Oftentimes it's the actual vendor paying not the borrower directly. So essentially it's the borrower kind of paying, but it comes out of the pocket of the vendor. So you disclose 500, the borrower pays 500, the appraiser gets 500, but then at the same time, the appraiser, the AMC pays, you know, a $15 fee for the credit card fee. So, um, you know, we see it very, very common that fee is including the appraisal fee and I'm obviously happy to provide some compliance backup around that so that folks feel comfortable including that and, and not having to separate it out as a line item. Um, the next question was, what are some modern payment methods that have had success? Um, the kind of most successful one that we've seen, like I said, is you have some technology that as soon as an appraisal order is initiated, will send out a payment link to the borrower using the LOS data. Typically, that's handled by the appraisal management platform. You know, someone like Rigor or something like that. We use a payment provider called Stripe. There's some other called authorized.net and things like that. Um, but essentially you want it, you know, kind of as smoothly embedded into your workflow. So I'd say it's typically handled by the, you know, appraisal technology vendor. Sometimes we see it handled by individual AMCs. If a, if a lender does not use a holistic appraisal management software, which I think can get um, a little bit dicey because it's not as standardized necessarily. So, you know, the recommendation is if you're not to use a appraisal management software there. Um, someone asked for the copy of the slideshow. Are we, are we just, I know we're sending out the recording. I don't know. Are we sending out 
yeah, slideshow. We'll, we'll be distributing all of that after 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 the session, in, including a, a on demand version of the of, of the of the webinar itself. Okay, cool. So it sounds like we'll get that out. And then the last question here was, can we can we then get the invoice to include that fee? Um, I'm assuming that's in reference to the credit card fee, maybe. Yeah. Um, I so. Yeah. I mean, once again, I, I can't speak for everyone else. I know that that that's something that we track and could could itemize. I assume that you know that that's trackable for other folks as well. And that and I think that's everything. All right. Um, well, this has been really informative. Uh, we've come to the end of, of the webinar. Mike and Brian, thank you so much for the insights that you've shared today. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, again, today's webinar was uh, brought to you in partnership with Regora. Mm -hmm.